Mr. York, are you in the building? Door to me, little redhead white guy. And he said to me, he says, I, I want to be your color. How can I get a tan? And my response was, we'll just go outside every day and lay out in the sun. You'll be my color very soon. And then that was the end of the color discussion is that he wanted to be like me. Right? So that as, as, as a child, there's no hate. There's no looking of color to be different. You want to be more alike. As I got older, um, and say when I was, uh, my because my parents moved around a lot, we um, finally settled in Tampa where my dad used to uh, live. That's where he grew up at. So we moved to St. Petersburg. We moved into a, a neighborhood that was predominantly white. It was so, it was a newspaper article event that African-American family moved into an all white neighborhood. So far, so much to that, they actually burned a cross in my yard. This is in high school. Um, told us to go home, there was all kinds of signs. Um, I was um, hanging out with most of the athletes, um, boxing, kickboxing. I was a little guy. So there were some challenges that went on. And I have to say, I won. <laughs> but uh, there was, it was really serious back then. I didn't know how dangerous it really was, but until you look back now and think about what could have happened. And I had a sister. So I had to protect her also. I had an incident once right across the street from my house when I was living in that neighborhood. We were skateboarding across the street. And this lady, she's walking down the street. And so I'm brought up to be very respectful and be, have manners. So got off my skateboard, picked it up and said, how are you doing this evening, ma'am? And she slapped me across my face. How dare you speak to me? But before she could get it out, it was a reflex. I hit her with a right cross and then realized that I had hit her and that there was going to be some trouble. So I walked right across the street to my house and tell my parents what had just taken this place. Here, less than 10 minutes later, here are the police at my door. And because my parents had been, you know, pretty savvy, pretty educated around what was, what we were going to have to do. Uh, and, and they knew me. They knew that wasn't, I wasn't malicious or to do something like that unless provoked. Uh, so I say this, I, I tell you these couple of stories of how I was raised and how I know how to um, carry myself in a world that doesn't always respect me or give me the credit that maybe do. Um, I tell you this, because of the George Floyd situation, at our employment, we took a stance. I, I had actually the employee resource group. It's the African American Employee Resource Group. It's called Sankofa. I named it when I got there. We told the management team that it was no longer acceptable to be quiet. Something had to be said. People were hurting. Because of the pandemic, 70% of the people in Detroit, where we have a site, that were dying, 70% were Black. I had a call center there that's 85% African American. African American. So I run a call center there and they're picking up the phone, answering people's concerns. They lost their job. They can't pay their medical bill. They need skip a pay. So I'm very concerned with the stress level that was actually in the call center for the workers. 
So I had to act quickly and say, they need some relief. Because that stress now is in their household. They're taking their kids and homeschooling them now virtually. There's no teacher there for them. Now you have to play parent and teacher. Again, no relief. Church is not going on the way it used to because social distancing. And now we're streaming church. So the pastor doesn't have that accessibility, nor can he reach out and hug you and comfort you that way anymore. Again, the stress level builds. So I needed my HR department, which I set up a meeting with them, to understand the level of stress for the African American. Along with Floyd, and that happened um, right after that happened, we had staff meetings with the entire employee uh, base that we were able to set up with AACUC. Actually, let's talk. And what I, what I called it, those sessions was, tell me how you feel, let's keep it real. So no sugarcoating what was going on. Let's talk about systemic racism and let's stamp it out, right? When you talk about systemic racism, when an African-American male goes for a job and say he, he's going to a company that he does not know, but he's up for that job and there's his Caucasian brother next to him that's applying for that job, 90% of the time, the white man is gonna be making more money than African-Americans. So if you ask, what was your current salary? They're not paying you what the job is worth. They're only gonna pay you what they have to pay you. So then that means that you take on systemic racism because you're never going to catch up. So the same thing happens is when you work internally and you come internally to get an opportunity and you get a entry level salary. So now you can only get a promotion to reach a certain level. It may be 3%, but why should it be 3% if the job level requires you to be a this? So we took that all back to HR and HR started making changes. And they instantly changed, um, not asking for the salary. Pay what it is worth so we can make sure that there, that is not an obstacle there. I wanna tell you this, that you guys are empowered to make change. When a photographer enters an all white room and then he, the professional, brings in people of color, he has to adjust the lighting and the focus so he can see the characteristics of the people in the room. So now I tell you, you're the professional. When you enter in those engagements, you gotta change the lighting and the focus so they can see you. That engagement you own. And you say, how do I do that? Engage. Just our engagements along at PSCU has enlightened us on how better relationships within a department. One lady told me, she says, I was afraid to talk about the George Floyd incidents with my employees because I didn't want to say the wrong thing. She says, after I talked to you, I knew I could no longer be silent. She says, because my daughter came to me and asked me about what was going on on TV. And what about, and she said, I saw them kill that man. Now this is a blonde, blue eyed little girl. She says, I could not be silent any longer. She said, you gave me the strength to go talk. She says, and guess what? 
She says, my team respected me for that, giving them that time to ask those questions. And she says, I, I, I feared it, but I don't know why I feared it so after having that conversation. What do you think? Are you guys photographers? Can you change the focus? It's easier than being said than done. But once you actually make that engagement in this environment, people are very receptive. Very much so. Now, I had an incident at one point in time where I was stopped by a police officer. I was about 19, 20 years old in, in South Carolina. And what happened was, is that I was speeding. And I had a little red car. So, you know, never supposed to have a red car. Always going to get stopped. It was brand new at that, and I was 19, 20 years old. So the guy stopped me, and he says, where are you going? And I had met somebody, and they were living in another state. A young lady I met on a cruise, so I wanted to see her. And I told him that. He says, um, I need you. To, he said, get out of the car, boy. I need you to put your hands on the car, boy. And don't talk back, boy. And so I knew I had already had to talk. It was the um, middle of the night on a dirt road that I've pulled across. And the officer said, I asked him a couple of questions. He says, if you keep talking, the price goes up on the ticket. He says, and I can raise the ticket until you have no more money in your pocket. And you're wearing a state you gotta pay on the spot or go to jail. So what did I do? Oh, very quiet for the rest of that time. I got my ticket and got out of there because <laughs> I didn't know where that jail was going to be. Um, and I was not about to encounter that. Um, that's why when people ask me, why do you have to talk with your kids, your nephews, other people's children? I treat them as they're my, they're my own, if they're even if they're not, because that's a sens senseless death for a kid to act up or do something, make a motion where a police officer would have to pull his gun. And we know that happens all the time. We know that happens for the African-American race. Uh, we're not supposed to be able to afford certain things um, and we couldn't have worked hard to get it. So we are always scrutinized by that. Um, so when we see it, and I, I talked to my white counterparts about that, that kind of stuff. So when we see it, we need to call it out. If we see that kind of behavior. So I've done a lot of talking. Uh, any questions that you guys have for me? Y'all, you can, you can unmute yourself if you have a question. Yeah, I guess Marvin, thanks for sharing, man. That's, that's a lot. Of course, um, you know, we live in Baltimore. You know, I don't live in Baltimore City now, but I was raised in Baltimore City all of my life, practically. And so we're the southern most north, you know, we're the, the, the northern most southern state. And so a lot of stuff that you deal with, we, we didn't have to deal with in Baltimore City. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious to know um, what happened when, you, you know, you hit the lady, police came to your house. How did that end up? <laughs> Well, my dad, um, my dad was a medic in the um, military. So um, he kind of had some clout with that. Plus, I didn't tell you is that he had five other brothers that were in the military. So we were a known military family. Okay. Um, and um, my dad knew some people downtown. So he kind of got the well. It the well huh? Yeah, it it in <laughs> it. Um, it ended okay because um, he was kind of connected. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. 
And I won't get that close to you, man. I didn't know you had that kung fu in you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing, man. You're welcome. We'll take uh, we'll take one more question. Anyone else have a, a question for Mr. York? I don't have a question, I guess. It's more so a comment. Um, I'm originally from the D.C. area. So a lot of times when I hear people speak of certain things, I, I can't relate because I've, I've not been impacted by it. I've, I've never been called boy. I've never felt that I was pulled over unjustified because most of the time I was speeding. So, you know, it's valid. Um, so sometimes I feel a disconnect because I cannot relate and I'm just trying to see how many people here, I know Adrian sort of just said he's from Baltimore City, um, where the population is, I'm used to seeing my color. Um, I work in Baltimore with Adrian at MeQ, so the majority of our staff is 79, 80% African American. So for me, it's just something I, I've not experienced in it's difficult sometimes trying to tie in and understand like the challenges you speak of. Yeah, I, I, you know, because we traveled a lot, I was born in New York City. Good boy in Manhattan. I lived in the Bronx. PS2 is the first school I actually went to. So, you know, I had seen, I seen the differences. In the South, it is totally different. Um, matter of fact, the police chief here um, told a, a one of the pastors that he was afraid when he took off his uniform. So in other words, blue erases black. As long as he had that uniform on, he was okay. But once he took it off, he was afraid if he got stopped by the police. It's that prominent in the South that that's the way you treat it. It is different. Um, so I say, does blue erase black or does black erase blue? Because uh, there was a YouTube um, session where they showed this FBI agent was on the, he, he was in plain clothes. And the way that they treated him until they pulled his ID out, then they, then it was all of a sudden, um, we're sorry officer. And he, he just told him, he says, I'll see you, you and you tomorrow. Cause I'm taking you up on charges. But it was only because he got let go because he was an FBI agent and his, his rights were violated. Thank you for sharing. And uh, Dwayne, that's, you know, that's, that's a really good question. And, um, you know, I'm sure we can unpack that a whole lot more. And hopefully over the course of this week, not only for you, Dwayne, but for all of us really, that something that's said will speak to us in a way uh, where it can connect and hopefully at some level you will at least be able to sympathize and 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 I, and I know you will because I know you personally um, but just to be able to say like wow you know that that's a real story that's happening to a real person someone I know and I think sometimes that's the way we can build those bridges uh, even if we haven't experienced it personally so um, thank you for that. We've got a couple more minutes and this is great and I wish we could keep going, but I, I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So let's do this. Um, I, I told you guys we want to engage you. So Marvin shared a great story reflecting back, I mean, all the way to his childhood and brought us all the way to now. Hopefully, as he was talking, you were reflecting yourself maybe these last few months or maybe like Marvin, you went back and were thinking of things that happened in your childhood. What I want everyone to do is on the chat right now, if you'll jump in and answer this question. And I want you to be real because if you're like me, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're not in tune with your emotions, I know we, we guys don't always like to talk about it, but this is a safe space and I want you guys to get real, okay? The question is, how are you truly feeling? What is your emotional state currently? And if you need to go back a couple of months, we want to know, throw it in the chat, how have you been feeling over the last three, four, five months? Or you can tell us what has your emotional state been? And, and if you need a couple minutes to think about it, that's fine. But um, 
Adrian said exhausted, drained. Definitely can relate to that. We got about 20 guys on the call, so scared, hopeful, overwhelmed. Scared and unsure. Angry, but now optimistic. I like that. I like that, Cedric. Angry and numb. Sad, angry. Jamie said, eye-opening. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Isolation is tough to deal with, for sure, for sure. Anthony said, <laughs> punch drunk. Yeah, just seems like something bad every day. That... That, my friend, is a true, true <laughs> statement. Looking for some light. Yeah, definitely. Sad and afraid, saddened. Craig says, ineffective, paralyzed, trying to figure out how and where to apply energy. Yeah. Stressed, heavy, numb. Hmm. Brent said, moving back and forth from panicked to inspired and back again. This is good. This is good. And, and, and I'm not just wanting you guys to put this in the chat just for my benefit, all right? We're, we're right here at our time. Let me leave you guys with this is, um, I, well, first, I appreciate you guys being open and honest. Um, I want you to hold on to this, whatever you posted in the chat, hold on to it. Um, I may even see if I can get a copy of our chat. Uh, because again, I want you guys to come back each day because what we're not going to do is stay in, in, in our state of, of sadness or depression or, ang or anger, right? The purpose of, of this conference is called Commi Commitment to Change. Today, we are reflecting. The last day, Friday, we're going to end on inspiration. And so each day, I want you guys to take a step forward. Uh, I want you guys to take something away from whether it's what the speaker said or, or uh, engagement that we have amongst this group. All right, let's continue this safe space. Um, I'm glad you guys are being reflective and transparent, and we're gonna build off of that each day, all right? Uh, Troy Simmons is on the call. He's gonna be up tomorrow talking about appreciation because one of the ways we move from having these feelings of sadness, depression, loneliness, anger, is to start naming things that we are appreciative for. Some of you said you felt inspired. I'm sure part of that comes from the fact that you're thinking about maybe simple things like the fact that, you know, you've got running water or hot water. And so Troy will, will lead us that in that tomorrow. Hey, uh, thank you guys for being here. Uh, don't forget to, to shout us out on your social media platforms with the various hashtags. If you know other men in your institutions or in your circles, please invite them. Uh, because we think that this is, well, we don't think, we know that this is gonna be very impactful by the time we finish up the week out, all right? Uh, appreciate you guys. And if you do have questions or comments that you couldn't ask during this time, uh, my contact info, Marvin's contact info, Adrian, it's all on the, the website. So when you log in, you can find our profiles. We have our email addresses listed there. Please reach out to us. We wanna connect with you guys, all right? Y'all have a great night, and we'll see you tomorrow. All right. Take Definitely. Care. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys.